you join me on the M20 in Kent, heading south towards Folkestone ahead of getting on a train to France. The reason for this will become clear very soon, I promise. But right now, I want to talk to you about Citroen. And look, I'm driving a Citroen right now, a C5 Aircross no less, and it's a thoroughly likeable thing. It's big, it's roomy, it's comfortable, it's interestingly styled inside and out, everything a good Citroen should be. But this car isn't what this video is all about. No, in this video, we're gonna be looking at the Citroen brand itself. Where does it come from? What does it stand for? What sets it apart? And in order to find out, we are gonna be taking you somewhere seriously cool. Honestly, you really want to stick around for this because it is going to be epic. But before we take a detailed look at the essence of the Citroen brand, we need to consider for a minute how Citroen operates as a business, both in the past and right now. So let's run the voiceover. L'élasticité de l'air et la souplesse de l'eau sont associées pour votre confort dans la suspension hydropneumatique Citroën. Citroën was founded by a chap called André Citroën in 1919 and quickly established a reputation for innovation and design flair. But due to a mixture of overambition and some iffy business decisions, the company went bust in 1935, but was thankfully saved by the Michelin Company, and then again in 1976, this time being saved by Peugeot. This partnership with Peugeot continues to this day, but that doesn't mean there hasn't been change. In recent years, both companies form part of French manufacturing company Group PSA, alongside DS and later Opel Vauxhall, and more recently, Group PSA merged with Fiat Chrysler Automobiles to form a huge international manufacturing superpower known as Stellantis. Stellantis owns and operates no fewer than 15 car brands internationally, many of which are available here in the UK and some of which are not. And in terms of overall global car sales in 2021, Stellantis was the world's fifth biggest car maker behind Toyota, Volkswagen, Hyundai and General Motors. So it is seriously big business then. And like a lot of similar industrial concerns, a big part of the Stellantis business model is the economy of scale. And what does that mean? Well, rather than all 15 brands doing their own research, development, parts production, assembly, manufacturing, and all that really expensive stuff, that involved in building cars, you make that investment once and you share it around all of your brands. That's why, although the cars from these brands all wear different badges and have different faces, many of them use the same parts and technology underneath. Now, that's all well and good, and it should mean that the immediate future is bright for Citroen. However, it also poses the brand a little bit of a problem. If you're sharing parts and technology with a bunch of other brands, then how do you stand out? How do you make yourself different? Well, a good way of deciding on your approach to that is by dipping into your heritage. Figure out what people have liked about your brand in the past and give them more of the same. But what is that for Citroen? Well, that is what we are just about to find out. Just before getting on the Eurotunnel, we stop off to meet Alex Robbins. You won't have seen Alex on the CarGurus UK YouTube channel before, but if you read the written editorial content on cargurus.co.uk, then you'll be very familiar with his work because he's one of our most regular contributors. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. You all right? Yeah. Go and have a seat, Let's we? Let's do it. Let's have a chat. And why have we met Alex? Well, as well as being one of our amazing team of experts on all things automotive, Alex is our resident Citroen nut. He's owned a string of them. He's an absolutely massive fan of the brand and anything that resembles a flaky old Citroen, well, he is all over it. And remember I said that we were gonna go somewhere exciting? Well, no one is more excited about it than Alex because he is coming with us. Just check out that grin. So there's a place on the northern outskirts of Paris called aulnay sous bois And once upon a time, it was one of Citroën's main domestic factories. It shut down in 2013, and these days it is home to a place 
called the Citroen Conservatoire. But what is that? Well, it's Citroen's archive, basically. It's a huge warehouse and it contains all sorts of things to do with the brand's history. So designs, blueprints, historical documents, but most importantly, lots and lots of cars. Around 300, in fact, and from every part of the company's history. And if you're thinking that it just sounds like any other car museum, then it really isn't because the conservatoire isn't open to the public. Yet we have been granted special access by Citroen UK and that really doesn't happen every day. And we're taking you with us. You're welcome. So, Mr. R. Yes, Mr. A. I know for a fact that you have owned uh, a string of Citroens. Mm, for my sins. Do you want to take us through them? I, I've not owned the Citroens I've always wanted to own, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, I've, I've actually owned the most, my most commonly owned Citroen is the BX. Um, I've had four BXs. So, the first BX I ever bought was in uh, about 2005 when I was at university and I needed a run around. It was a 1.7 TZD Turbo. One of these was going cheap for 300 quid and I thought, well, I quite fancy that as a, as a run around. That would do quite nicely for my schlepping between Wales and Southampton where I lived at the time. And a good mate of mine and I decided to drive it down to the south of France for our summer holidays. While we were down there, there was a very large downpour of rain while we were driving back from the shops. Uh, we sort of uh, found there were lots of flooded roads and I sort of thought to myself, well, this will be fine. I'll put the suspension up on high. One of the floods, it turned out it was quite deep. We took it to a garage, the garage said it was basically condemned it and we left it down there and flew home. I then went through a series of other bangers before I sort of got the urge to have another BX and I bought exactly the same type of BX again, another TZD Turbo which was going up for sale. That one was less reliable. I repaired the things that needed repairing and I, I sold it on to somebody else and I just thought I'd better get something a little bit newer and a little bit more sensible. Um, but the BXs I really wanted were the 16 valves. You can sort of fast forward a few years when I had a very, very small amount of money to spend on a performance toy and I bought a 16 valve. On the face of it was a good car, but it was a money pit. And then in addition to the BXs, I've had two Xantias, which again fell into the university runaround categories. So yeah, that's kind of basically where I am. You know, as I say, I've not owned the Citroens I really want to own, which is the big old ones, you know, the XMs and the CXs, but I kind of feel like that's in my future. You know, those are, those are things I've got to look forward to, and, you know. Really, those are the big aims, you know, those are the ambitions to come back to. So where does this fascination with the brand come from? Well, I've got an affinity with the South France because I used to spend a lot of time down there when I was a kid. And uh, I adored my time down there. And one of the overriding things I remember, there were countless hydropneumatic Citroens driving around down there. And I just adored these things that looked like spaceships, you know, to me in my young, impressionable uh, mindset. Added to that, my dad was changing his car one year and went to look around a car supermarket and unfortunately he didn't buy it but they had a white BX19 GTI in there with black leather seats right. and I just thought this thing was tremendous because of course having grown up with them you know on my, as a thing of my holidays I think I associated Citroens with my holidays at the time yeah. so they were very I had very good memories and very good connotations with them and but then I think the, th the thing that sealed the deal was I remember standing outside our house one day when some friends, family friends had come to visit and they got in their BX estate to drive back home. And they started the engine and the thing lifted because it had sunk yeah. and it off it went. And I turned around and said to them, what? how's it, what's, <laughs> what's happening there? And he explained to me that Citroën's had funny suspension that meant they went up and down and that was it. Yeah. As a kid, a car that goes up and down. <laughs> it's like night riding. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then I found out you had a lever inside and you could make it do that at will. <laughs> Grief. I... When we get to where we're going at the other end, mm. I think you are not going to know where to look first. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited, I have to say. The Conservatoire is, uh, you know, it's somewhere I've always wanted to visit. It's, a, uh, it's an incredible place and there's so much history there and to get up and close and personal with some of those amazing old cars. Uh, so yeah, that's all very exciting, I must say. On arrival in Paris, we hit our hotel for some dinner and a kip, and then it's up early the next morning for the big day.
Are you ready for this? Ah, uh, as ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> oh, bloody. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, jeez. Oh, I feel a bit lightheaded. <laughs> Shoot, look at this. Isn't that something? That is incredible. I mean, I'm a bit speechless, to be honest with you, Ivan. I don't really know what to make of it. It's, it's astonishing. I mean, there's so much history here, it's just... Where do we start? I mean, obviously, we can't talk about everything, because... Well, I mean, there's just is... too much to talk about, isn't there? I mean, it's Absolutely. just such a... But I think what we should do is probably just pick out, like, the greatest hits yes. the, uh, of, of, of Citroen and the cars that gave the company its, um, its reputation for innovation and yeah. everything else. I think that's probably a good idea. Right. Um, so, should we start with the, uh, the, the car Taipei. that came first? Yes, the Taipei. absolutely. This is the first car Citroen produced, mass produced. Um, 1919? That's right. Uh, it had a 1.3 litre four cylinder engine, which produced all of 18 oh. of your finest horsepower. Lovely. Um, Semi elliptical leaf springs. Braking was on the rear wheels only. Okay. It's brilliant. And it was operated by a hand lever inside the car. Okay. There was a pedal which uh, operated a transmission brake right. um, as well. That's not uh, going to get which, confusing, is it? Well, it wasn't too much of a worry because you only had 18 horsepower to play oh, with. That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a, an enormous concern. But, but yeah, this was where, where it really started for Citroen. Um, and, uh, you know, cars that, the cars that we're about to see that came after this, um, yeah, this was, this was, this was the, uh, the, their origin, basically. Number one. That's it, pretty much. And so on to... Uh the next big thing. Wow. Yeah, it really was actually. Um, so this is the original traction. Debuted at the Paris Motor Show in 1934. Um, a lot of people think it was famous because it was the first monocoque car, but it wasn't. Uh, what it did was it combined a number of other technologies that had debuted on cars in a few years previous to that. Um, actually, uh, Citroen, Andre Citroen at the time, um, held the um, license for, I think it was Bud, uh, to build one of his cars in France. And right. Bud showed um, Citroen a prototype front wheel drive car and Citroen loved this idea so much, he decided to develop his own. And that took about, he actually managed to do that in about 18 months. So like all the best ideas, he nicked it. Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. Um, um, but it took about 18 months for him to do that, which is a remarkably quick development time, yeah. you know, especially when you think kind of what cars were like at that time yeah. and, and how long it would have taken to develop these new technologies that were going into it. But anyway, um, he then combined that front wheel drive with a monocoque chassis. So what that means is, so the Rosalie here, which came before it, this is a body sitting on top of a frame. Mm -hmm. So you'd build a big, strong frame and then you put the body on top of it. Um, but uh, the idea of a monocoque was the strength was combined, was contained, sorry, within the actual body of the car rather than within the frame. Um, and to demonstrate how strong it was, um, Citroen actually arranged to drive one of these off a cliff <laughs> together with another car from a competitor manufacturer that was a body on frame. Right. Um, uh, it was an eight metre cliff. He drove both cars off. At the end of it, you could open the doors of the traction the other car was completely obliterated. Right, it was okay. just a mangled mess on the Amazing. floor. And it was, one of the, it was that demonstration that really assured people of the strength yeah. of these cars. So these are the Traction 11s. These are still four cylinder cars, but these are now 1.9 litre engine. Mm -hmm. um, so they're a little bit more powerful. These were enormously popular. Yeah. They sold lots of different variations of these. Um, you can see we've got different body styles here. So these, these were the kind of the normal saloons. Um, and they also did a, a six window. So this is the six, this is the four. You can see this one's okay, got four yeah, windows yeah. on the side. This is a six window. And then the six window progressed into the familial as well, which actually had nine seats. Right. So it was a, oh, the, probably the original MPV. If no, you right. Okay. But of course, the 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 real the big Citroen everyone remembers is the one up at the end here, which is the light 15, um, 15 horse, uh, 15 CV. Oh. Sorry, I should say. Yeah. Um, uh, so this was actually a six cylinder engine, 2.9 liters. Um, and really, this was kind of the, the, the culmination of the luxury big Citroen, the, yeah. the idea of a, you know, a luxurious large Citroen. This is kind of where this that started, right. effectively. This is Genesis. Pretty basically. much, yeah, that's right. Elle n'a qu'un œil, enfin qu'un phare, et seulement une manivelle pour la mettre en route. These are the TPVs, or Très Petite Voiture, um, 
which are essentially 2CV prototypes, as you can probably tell. Yeah. Uh, this really was the original concept for the 2CV, which was four wheels under an umbrella. Yep. Um, I mean, it really was just supposed to replace farmer's horse and cart. Um, it was supposed to be as simple as it possibly could be. And you can really see that idea in the fact these early prototypes only had one headlight. <laughs> you know, they, they, they didn't even have... Uh, the, 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 the windows on this one are just little flaps, which is you know, how they ended up on the actual 2CV yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah. And I think you can see, you can just kind of see on the roofs over there, they're held on with little studs. Right. So you just un unpop the studs and roll it back. <laughs> um, you know, the, so, so this is really where the idea of the 2CV came from. It is remarkable, really, um, what the 2CV became. I mean, it really was... Uh, you know, uh, an astonishing thing. It sounds like a cliche, but it actually was the idea that it should be able to drive across a ploughed field with a basket of eggs in the back and not one of them should break. Yes. That was kind of the original uh, design brief, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, but there were other little aspects of it that, you know, uh, were intended to be for family use. So, for mm -hmm. example, the, the seats inside, you can take the seats out Mm -hmm. and plonk them next to the car <laughs> and sit there and have a picnic with Brilliant. your family. So you drive your, your car across your plough field and then at the other end you'd get out and have your picnic with your, you know, your seats, you'd take your seats out and sit. Fantastic. Eat your basket of eggs. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. How many are we talking here? I've, I've, I've got a, ver a number of about five million in my head. Does yeah, that sounds sound about right, right. yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it was phenomenally successful yeah. for what is basically a little tin box. Yeah with a two-cylinder boxer engine, air-cooled. It was all incredibly mechanically simple. And so while all this was going on, so this is kind of mobilising the nation. Yes. And at the same time, you've got all of that going on. Mm -hmm. At the other end of the scale, <laughs> you've got this going yeah, on. Yeah, quite. I mean, it really was, at the time, Citroen was a, it was almost a, a company <clears throat> of two halves, really. Yeah. Because at one end you had it producing things like the 2CV and then at the other end there was this, which, I mean, arguably, so if the 2CV is the car Citroen's best known for, this yeah. is probably the car, it's the, se the second best known yeah. Citroen of all, the DS. This took over from the big Citroens we were just looking at yeah. just now. So you've gone from this upright, vintage, tall radiator grill to this incredible, mm. I mean, it's a spaceship, isn't it? It Absolutely, looks like yeah. a UFO. And when it made its debut, it must have just looked, I mean, literally like it landed from another planet. It wasn't just the looks. Obviously, under the skin, the DS was revolutionary. You know, it had hydro pneumatic suspension. So instead of using normal shocks and springs, it had a series of suspension spheres, and those spheres contained like a little membrane. One side of the membrane is gas, the other side is fluid, and the fluid's pushing up on the membrane, suspended by the gas, and it completely replaced the need for any um, springs or dampers. And it also meant that the car could self-level, the height could be adjusted, and it, of course, gave a cushiony soft ride, which was kind of the, the, the main idea. That idea of comfort being central to the driving experience, mm. that really was, uh, you know, where it came from. And, you know, part of the reason for that, obviously, was that at the time, France's roads were in terrible, terrible shape. Mm -hmm. This one yeah. here, you can see here, it's got these wonderful fared-in headlights, and the inner headlights moved with the steering, yeah. which, of course, is something that is quite common on modern cars. Take for, take for granted. Take for granted yeah. these days. And, and, you know, is done in, it was originally set up in exactly the same way, and it was, it was actuated by the steering. Um, and this one was cable-operated, so right. as the wheel turned, the cable, little cable pulled the inner, <laughs> inner light backwards and forwards. Um, and so you could therefore see round corners. The light would go. follow you round corners. And, you know, such a simple idea, but it, it found its home maybe 50 years later. Yeah. You know, it was so ahead of its time yeah, in all yeah. these little amazing little ways. Right, so what we're we looking at here? Well, the interesting thing is what I just mentioned to you about the two, the company having two sides. Yeah. The big challenge Citroen faced there on was to unite those two sides. Yes. So you start to see cars like these appearing. These are the Amis and the Dianes. These were based on the same platform as the 2CV, um, but with enlarged engines, more space. So they're trying to fill that gap yeah, between the, the two. Yeah, the gap. Exactly. Um, but then at the same time, they're coming up with stuff like this. So this is the Mahari. This wasn't actually, it wasn't actually Citroen's idea, funnily enough. It was Count Roland de la Poipe. That is the most tremendous name it's I've fabulous, ever, ever heard. He was, a, he was a World War II fighter ace who, after the war, became a plastics industrialist. Um, and he started a company called SEAB. 
uh, and he came up with the concept of the Mahari, which was basically an entirely plastic body um, on a 2CV frame. Yep. And he took it to Citroen and he said, look at this that I've made. And they said, that's great, we'll make that. <laughs> and that. lo and behold... Another stolen now, idea. Pretty much, yeah. It's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? And of course, in the process of trying to fill in that gap between the two sides of the company, this was then the next logical step. So a car that sat kind of between the big luxury saloons and the mm -hmm. 2CV and this was it. This was the GS, which I believe you're familiar with. I am. My dad had one of these when I was a kid. So my earliest years were spent rattling around in the back seat of one Fabulous. of these. Fabulous. With, with my three sisters. <laughs> uh, no seat belts or anything like that. But then, of course, there came the unenviable task of replacing the DS, yes. which had lasted many, many more years because, of course, it was so advanced. Yeah. It, it could last that long. Absolutely. Um, and this was where that started. Um, this was Projet L, which was the um, uh, first kind of original idea of what would later become the CX. <laughs> Power steering into fifth. <laughs> Fingertip controls. Oh. Hello. Anything wrong, dear? No, I just woke up. I thought I'd left the lights on. And the CX, it took all of the innovations from the DS and packaged them in this incredible aerodynamic body shell. Because mm. at that time, Citroen really was starting to experiment with aerodynamics and yeah. to, to work out that that was actually, you know, the next big uh, modern innovation. So we're moving on a little bit in history. Before we do, <laughs> we've got to mention all this amazing motorsport stuff that we're not even touching on, but just look at it. Marvel, um, isn't it? It's incredible. So this is, uh, these are the visas. Now, of course, by this time, the venerable 2CV was still going strong, but Citroen was sensing that at some point it would have to replace it. Mm -hmm. So it started casting about for a small car that it could do that with. Mm -hmm. Early ones actually had an air-cooled uh, engine, a larger version of the old 2CV engine. Later ones like this moved to a, a more modern water-cooled design. But again, you had some of the innovations even from the bigger Citroens with these. So for example, the, the dashboard was absolutely bonkers. Mm. Um, it was called the PRN dashboard and that meant that it had all the controls at your fingertips instead of stalks. You had switches for the lights and indicators and wipers were all round here in these sort of odd pods either side of the steering wheel. So it was just as wonderfully wacky. Yeah. Um, uh, these, are, these have actually got a very special place in my heart because my second and third cars were visas. Oh, were I they? Had a, I had a, a 1.7 diesel, oh, which right. I then replaced with another 1.7 yep. diesel, yep. Uh, which I had to get rid of because mechanically, absolutely mm -hmm. unfallible. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to get rid of it because I shut the driver's door one day and the bottom of it fell off because it was so rusty. <laughs> this is obviously where my love of Citroen started was with BXs. And the BX is a really significant car for Citroen because it was the first car developed entirely under the auspices of Peugeot. Yeah. Um, so it was very much the shape of things to exactly. come, wasn't it? I mean, earlier cars, like the Visas had bits of Peugeot in their engineering and, and this, that and the other. There was some kind of oversight, but this was the first one that was developed entirely under Persia. Parts of the BX were um, composite bodywork in order to keep it light. Yep. The, the steel was lightweight in order to keep fuel, uh, fuel economy um, uh, or fuel consumption to a minimum, I should say. You again had the PRN controls. Um, but it then mixed all that with, it made that technology in a form which was much more um, affordable to engineer and to work on. Sure. And that made the BX a much more viable solution for the segment it went into. Mm. And that was really important because actually at that time, this was kind of the end of that merging of those two sides of the company, if you yeah. can imagine. The this big, is where the big they versus small. That's exactly. Where they met. This is where they met in the middle. They brought it out with this very good diesel engine, which mm. made it very economical. Mm. Um, and that meant that um, lots of fleet managers were very, very keen to run them mm. because it meant they kept their fuel costs down. Mm. And this actually became Britain's best selling diesel car. Did it really? Uh, for, for a certain amount of time. But then it also spawned these wonderful sporty models as well which because of that lightness were great to drive. Yeah. They were fast, they were agile, um, and they had that hydropneumatic suspension which also made them incredibly comfortable. Sure. Then of course from the BX, you're into the XM. Um, again, 
Citroen going back to its spaceship design roots. Mm -hmm. Lovely big Citroen, beautiful things. Um, and really, this is about as close as we can get to the modern day yeah. um, within this museum. <clears throat> this is the last C5. And the interesting thing about this is this is sort of a direct lineage from the BX. This is, which the, is, this is the, the big wafty Citroen that yeah. we all... We all Exactly, exactly. And, and, you know, the, the interesting thing about this is this was kind of the last uh, of the cars that the BX lineage started. So those big fleet kind of family retmobile type mm. cars. Um, and it's got to a point now where there's just no money in those types of cars anymore. So Citroen has had to can this line that started there. Because Hence why we've come down here and C5 air crosses. Exactly right. Everybody wants SUVs. Because that's, that's where, where people are. And in fact, Citroen's just launched its last roll of the dice with regard to that yeah. um, kind of lineage with a car called the C5X, which is um, a sort of weird amalgam of an SUV and a state and a hatchback and a saloon car. And a coupe. And exactly. What, and it's, it's its last go else. at trying to build a car like this yeah. uh, and trying to make it succeed. Um, so, so really, that, that's where we are in the modern that's, age. And that's, that, that brings us up to date. Honestly, mate, this place is straight up incredible, isn't it? Oh, this is such a once in a lifetime opportunity to wander around here. It was mm. so, so lucky. Things are about to get a bit more exciting. Let's have a little walk outside for a minute, shall we? So we have spent our morning looking around a bunch of lovely old Citroens. And now, my friend, we are going to get to drive some. <laughs> get in. So oh we have six cars assembled that the lovely folk here have allowed us to drive. I have a feeling we're going to be coming back to that one. <laughs> don't don't um, take me away. <laughs> <laughs> so here we've got the 2CV Spot Special Edition. Yeah. That so was is, yeah. 76 mm -hmm. to celebrate the 5 million That's right. 2CV. Yep. What a colour scheme as well. It's, pretty, it's quite something, <laughs> isn't it? We've got a lovely old plastic body oh, Mahari. Oh. Feels a bit flimsy. <laughs> Uh, the BX that you're familiar with, but yep. this is the BX19 Digit. So this is the Digit, that's right, which had a digital dashboard and trip computer. Get in. Yep. Um, a ratty old 2CV with some numbers on the side. <laughs> and uh, a traction event. Indeed. So we've got six assembled. Mm -hmm. We have only got time, I'm afraid, to drive three of them. Okay. So we have got to choose very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. um, but I would think that we've got to start where it started for Citroen as the brand it became. I agree. So we've it's got to, got to be the, the track. It's got to be the track. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So I think you need to drive this right, one. Right, no problem at all. Right, off we go. In La Traction Avant. On La Vie Jolie. Yeah. <laughs> so that's second that's up second. there. There Nicely we go. Done. Right, off we go. Wow. That's great. I am astonished by how modern this thing feels, given how old it actually is. It feels so together, doesn't that it? That is astonishing. That's remarkable. I mean, oh, it brakes are a little bit that, uh, and that's, less uh, modern. That's where it feels a bit more comfortable. <laughs> oh, wow, what a tremendous thing to drive. So this is the 11 uh, CV Taxion. It's got a lick of speed. It really, it? it's got a lot of low down torque, actually, this engine. Like far more than you'd expect for an old kind of 1.9 litre four pot to have. But it feels, and the thing is, it's wonderful it because it's, it feels like an old car. You've got this lovely sit up and beg driving position and this amazing view out over the bonnet. That's lovely, isn't it, with those little pod lights? It is, it's fabulous. And yet, the engine sounds and feels like a modern engine. It really does. It's remarkable. Although there is water coming, start to coming through the roof. That's, so that's character, that's, that's what uh, that is. That's what that is. Just because it's a monocoque, it feels much more like the cars that we're used to, yeah, the modern true. cars we're used to. Whereas, uh, I mean, that doesn't account for the engine's smoothness and modernness, but it, it does account for why the ride is actually very good, yeah. why it doesn't feel like it's bouncing around all over the place like so many old cars do. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's, it's a lovely thing from that point of view. It actually feels really, really nice to drive. Um, and yeah, you could drive, you could go, go all day in this, absolutely quite happily. I can, I can see why this would have felt like such an innovation in its time. Yeah. Because it feels so modern. This is the first car 
of this era that I've ever driven and thought I could own this. Yeah. I'd be quite happy with this. This is a lovely old thing. Yeah, this is the surprise of the day for me, really. This yeah. is this is really quite something. And I can see now sort of what all the fuss is about with these. Oh, what a lovely thing. It really is, isn't it? Well, that was a pretty amazing start. Wasn't I it? I think you'll agree. Absolutely. Where do we go next? Or rather, where do we not go next? I think we need to eliminate some of the ones we're not going to drive. Well, it's a very good point. Um, so I'd say first off, and with a heavy heart, probably the BX. I mean, I love BXs. They're one of my favourite Citroëns, as you well know. Yep. This one's a digit. It's quite special because it's very rare from that point of view. But I've, dri I've driven a lot of BXs in my time. It's probably not the one to spend our time doing today, given That's there's so much else here. Absolutely right. The Mahari is effortlessly very cool. I love it. But you can't come somewhere like this and not drive a 2CV Ooh, when I you've got the right. opportunity. Yeah. The question in my mind is, do we drive the lovely pristine special edition or do we drive the ratty old yellow one? I think you know the answer to that, don't you? I think I do and it's going to be the ratty old yellow one. And there is good, a very good reason why, which will soon become clear if it's not already. And I am going to take the wheel for this one. I think you should. The reason we have chosen the snotty yellow one is because this is quite a famous car. This car is in fact one of the stunt cars used to film the Bond movie For Your Eyes Only starring Roger Moore and Carol Bouquet. Um, so essentially I am driving a Bond car Alex. You are, that's right yes. I have, nev I have never been more like Roger Moore in my entire existence. Your posterior is where Roger Moore's posterior once sat. I know. That's remarkable. It's, it's, it's quite a thing. Mm. I mean, it's not the silver Aston Martin DB5. <laughs> it's not the Lotus Esprit that turns into a submarine. No. But it's a Bond car and I will take that <laughs> all day and all night. You might be a Citroen fan, mate, but I I'm a Bond buff. Do you want to know the most useless Bond fact there is? I certainly do. So, there's only one person to ever sing more than one Bond theme. Oh, okay. That person has sung three Bond themes. Hang on, Go can on. I guess? Go on. Is it Shirley Bassey? It is. Hey! Can you name the films? Ah, ah, uh, no, I don't think I can. Um, it was Go Goldfinger. Yep. It was Diamonds Are Forever. Yep. Of course. And it was Moonraker. Oh, Moonraker. Yeah, that's the one you forget. Yeah, you're right. Right, where's second again? <laughs> Gearboxes. Something else. Oh. <laughs> so this is one of the cars used in the film, as we've said, and. Uh, it's actually not a standard 2CV, it's actually built on an AMI chassis, which is the same platform, but it's a bit bigger. Um, and it also allowed them to fit a bigger engine so that the car would look a bit more athletic on screen. Jim? Yeah, so a 602cc two-cylinder engine was swapped in this for a one-litre four-cylinder engine. So. 26 horsepower became 54 horsepower. So this one has got quite a lot more poke than your average 2CV. And to, to be honest with you, this is my first time driving a 2CV. It's slightly terrifying, I'll be honest. <laughs> I mean, the gearbox alone, oh my goodness, the, the brakes. <laughs> uh, where, am I, where, where am I going with that? It's there. It's there. All right. Always, gear changes you have to think about, I'm afraid. They didn't do um, this in the bomb film. No, they didn't. 
Uh, but they did get chased by some bad lads in a couple of Peugeot 504s. They did, they did that's right, yeah. And it rolled down the hillside and it was all fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of feel like I'm gonna, I'm gonna obliterate the gearbox at any given point in time. I mean, I've never been more like Roger Moore, <laughs> but I, I somehow s seem to be sitting here next to the least attractive Bond girl of all time. What can I say? Love you as I do, mate. <laughs> I'm not a patron, Carol, but Kate, you're not. I will give you that. Fair enough. Your bucket list ticked. I've driven a Bond car with really poor brakes. <laughs> well, mate, I've just realised one of my lifelong ambitions. I think it's about time you did the same. Um, yeah. I've known you for a lot of years uh, and I know what this car means to you. Quite. So do you want to explain? Well, I mean, it's the SM, isn't it? It's the, it's the, the pinnacle, it's peak Citroen. It's, uh, it was the top of the range, it was the Halo model uh, when the DS was around. I've wanted to drive one of these ever since I knew what one was, frankly. Um, uh, Maserati engine, 2.7 litre V6. Um, the most, probably the most luxurious Citroen of its time. It is your lottery win car, this, exactly isn't it? That. We've talked about exactly this many that. times. It's a dream car, well and truly. And without further ado, mate, <laughs> the time has come. <laughs> oh, crikey. Oh. Drink it in, Mr. R. Oh, God. Oh, there's oh. got the suspension. Suspension's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That actually took me by surprise. Really? Oh, holy, wow. So while Alex concentrates on doing the driving and taking it all in, I'm going to give you the uh, pertinent facts about this car. So as he said earlier on when we were in the hall, the thought behind it was to make a DS Coupe to be the Halo model um, and it would be powered by a Maserati V6 which came as a result of an agreement with Maserati that would eventually see Citroen buying the Maserati company. The engine itself was fed by three Weber carburettors, it had a power output of 168 brake horsepower at 5,500 revs. Um, According to my notes, it was um, four overhead camshafts, two valves per cylinder, and had a top speed of 137 miles an hour and a 0 to 62 of just under nine seconds. So that's all the facts and figures. Importantly, I can see from the smile on your face, young man, that you're rather enjoying the reality. Remarkable. It really is it's fascinating, actually, having driven DS. It's obviously more powerful. As you can probably hear, it's just started raining as well. So it's all going very well here, but what a lovely thing. I mean, you can feel there's barely any lean to the suspension yeah. as we go around these corners. That Admittedly, ride is sublime. Yeah, we're not going all that quickly, but you can feel how composed it is. The gearbox is surprisingly uh, tight and really quite kind of sharp. Um, the clutch is a little bit soft, but I mean, it isn't. She's an old thing, so I'm just—I'm not pushing her too hard at the moment. Well, absolutely. She has got those typical kind of Citroen brakes, where you have to be really careful on the big sort of brake button. Well, Electric windows, obviously. This being a, well, a luxurious car, but of course. And have a look at this. These doors are actually frameless, and you can see the frames are attached yeah, yeah. to the tops of the windows. Yeah. But this is—I mean, it's about just going to give her a little bean. Here we go. Oh, here she goes. Oh. I mean, you can imagine thundering across France in this yeah. thing, you know, with many miles to cover, but every one of them would just be an absolute joy, wouldn't it, yeah. you know? It does that Citroen thing of you can actually hear more than you can feel. Yeah. All these old hydropneumatic Citroens, whenever I drive one, I always find, what you get is you can, you can hear the road imperfections coming up yeah. through the tyres, but actually, if you think about it, you're not really feeling them through your behind, yeah, so to speak, yeah. you know? That's a lovely mechanical noise when it's you It's really, it's really right. nice, isn't it? It's got a, and it's got a lovely scent, it's got a lovely feel as yeah. well to it, that. I mean, it really is, it's almost, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a sports car gear change, but it doesn't feel like a big, wallowy, wafty Grand no. Tourer. It feels quite precise and quite tight. You know, I've driven cars much newer than this that had much more vague gear changes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, of course, I would say that. It's my blooming dream car. I'm predisposed <laughs> to love it, but 
even so, despite that, I am having a spectacularly good time. <laughs> the big question is, has it lived up? Well, they say don't meet your heroes. Uh, and in this case, I absolutely would recommend you should meet your heroes. <laughs> this is, it's just lovely. Is it, is it what you thought it would be? Uh, it isn't actually. You know what? I thought it would be a lot more wafty and wallowy. I and mean, it is wafty, but it also feels precise yeah. and controlled. It's the full package. It's the Citroen that has everything. Um, yeah. You know, so it still, it still is at the very top of my list. I hope you have enjoyed this little road trip as oh. much as we have, um, and as much as Alex especially has. Um, and uh, we'd love to know what you think in the comments. In the meantime, do like the video, do subscribe to the Car Gurus UK YouTube channel. And if you want to buy a car, probably not this one, because I'm not sure we've got many uh, <laughs> SMs on Car Gurus, but do head over to cargurus.co.uk um, to find your next new car. And using our super clever pricing technology, we'll even tell you if the dealer selling it is giving you a good deal or not.